Welcome back to another episode of the Lender Podcast. My name is Bryce. I'll be your host today. And today, I'm very excited because we have a special guest, Mr. Lauren Wernett. Lauren, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. How are you today, Bryce? Hey, I'm great. Thanks for being here. So before we get started, I just I just have to say, um, is this is this not the most like kick-ass community that you've ever been a part of? Because I, I feel like every every like lender that I talk to, they're so like willing to chat, hop on a phone call, just jump in and like say what they're doing or what's worked for them. And, and I, I don't know about you, but like, at least when I was born, like in the rentals and the flipping, there was kind of like a, maybe like a, a slimy aspect to it. Like, of course there's always like the good ones out there too. Right. But there's also like the, the gurus and the, you know, the people who are just selling courses and things like that. But I haven't necessarily found that to be the case in like the lending space. So I, um, anyway, it's, I just, I just love to like chat with people and, and see what's going on. And I just think the, the community is so kick-ass. So I don't know if yeah, you found the same. Yeah, I, I but. agree. I, I think the way, the reason that a lot of us got to where we are in life is by being open to other perspectives and willing to learn. Right. And that's what makes it so awesome is everybody just wants to learn everything that they can, which makes great conversations. Absolutely. Yeah. It makes for a really cool group of people. So anyway, okay. So with that out of the way, let's, uh, uh, like, you know, we, you and I met not that long ago. Um, you know, we're in a, a similar coaching, uh, mastermind group. And, uh, you know, as, as soon as I, you know, I remember reading through like the, the live chat that was on the side and, and you were talking about, uh, lending and real estate. I was like, I, I wonder if he's in that. So yeah, we, we connected right away. And, um, you know, like I said, you were like within that first week, you were happy to hop on a call and, and just chat. So, um, obviously I, I know you a little bit better than, than the rest of the audience, but, uh, give us just kind of the, the high level overview, the elevator pitch, just tell us about yourself. Sure. Uh, Lauren Wynette, live in North Carolina. I own and operate REI Transactional, which does short-term lending for real estate developers and flippers. Uh, prior to starting this, I built out a 86-unit rental portfolio in about three years, uh, did a bunch of flipping as well, and then basically got to the point where I was realizing I was making as much or maybe just a little bit more than our lenders and doing a lot more work. Um, and so started the lending business about a year and a half ago, focused on wholesalers and double closings, then added gap loans in end of last year. And so far this year, we've lent out about $2 million, just under $2 million uh, with another, uh, about a, another three quarters of a million going out in the next three weeks. Um, and expect to just keep growing from there. We've got a ton of demand and some of the best uh, investors that I work with that are extremely loyal. Uh, over the course of the last three years, I've borrowed from them about $10 million and paid back to them pretty considerable returns. That's amazing. I love it. Okay. So we've, we've got a, a lot to unpack here because I, um, I, I know you, you just barely, uh, quit your, your W2 job, uh, a couple of weeks ago, which congratulations. That's very exciting. Um, but it's, uh, it's interesting because I had no idea that you had, uh, a background in crop and soil science. That is oh, yeah. a, a very, um, very unique. I, I don't see a lot of people in that industry that move into, into real estate. Usually you have like the, the tech bros or the engineers or the finance guys, you know, like they, they seem to do that. But, uh, I'm curious when you got started first with like the rentals, was it out of interest? Was it out of desperation? Was it, you know, how did you get from plant and soil science to real estate investing? So I've gone through a couple of different shifts in my career. Um, and the reason those shifts happen is because I just have an insatiable desire to learn new things. Mm. Um, so real estate came not because of an overall love of real estate, but a desire to put my family in a better position. COVID happened in 2020. We had a small baby and two small children. And I just didn't want to work in a nine to five job the rest of my life and asking for time off. And so we started down a couple different paths. We had an Amazon FBA business for mm. about a year, um, then shut that down and then started into real estate as I just saw that as the best opportunity, best vehicle at the time uh, to pursue my desire of financial freedom. And along the route, I never really thought about myself as a real estate guy. Like I was using real estate to do what I was doing, but I was always more of a business guy, right? When I was in crops and soil science, I actually was a junior partner for a small consulting firm there um, and then left that to go into um, sales for a large co corporation um, and then did that, you know, worked for that large corporation for about 10 years where I realized I really didn't like working for large corporations. 
um, and then just recently left that. But real estate has always been a vehicle, but business is where I'm been more interested in and probably mm. why I've leaned heavily into and have taken a full shift towards the lending side of things um, versus like rent the rentals, which I'm you know, in the process of exiting out of and selling my half of those to my business partner. Um, it just fits my overall long-term goals much better than the rentals that rentals do um, and allows me a lot of opportunity for growth. I love it. I love it. Okay. And um, it, it sounds like we're, we're in a similar spot in the sense that like you're a, you're a serial entrepreneur. Like you've, you've got a, a graveyard of, you know, past businesses that either worked or, or didn't work, you know, and like, and I, I think, I think we all do. I'm, I don't want to, I don't want to touch on it too much because it's kind of the outside of the, the scope of this podcast, but um, I'm curious what happened with your Amazon FBA and why, why that didn't work and why you saw real estate as such a good um, vehicle moving forward to transition out of that. I mean, so we started it, like I said, when we had a couple small kids and we were making okay money, but the margins were relatively tight. I think we were averaging about 16 to 18% mm. and we were doing everything ourselves. Um, and it just basically came down to, there's gotta be slightly more passive ways to do, to make money without having to give up all of our time with our kids. Um, because at that time we were sourcing a lot of products. And then when we were done sourcing, then we were labeling and packing and shipping stuff off of Amazon. Everything. And my mm. wife and I were both involved in it. And we were giving up a lot of time with our then, you know, like four or five month old and our four year or five year old and our three year old at the time. Um, wow. it just was it didn't, didn't seem worth it for, we were giving up more than what we were getting. Um, and so we're like, we're going to just park this. We're going to, we got some return retained earnings from this and we're just going to find some other vehicle to drive us forward besides this. I love it. Hence the rentals. Okay. I uh, agree. That, that's, that's, that's beautiful. And, 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 and full disclosure, we, we found the exact same thing. You know, I've, I've had different digital product services and, and little, you know, one-off businesses here and there, but like, we didn't really kind of catch our stride until we got into the real estate thing. Um, mm -hmm. I remember, uh, when we first got started, we, we bought, um, we, like my wife and I, we were both house hacking at the time, even before we got married. And I remember when we sold our first property, we walked away with a check for like $40,000 or something like that. And that was, that was the light bulb moment for us. You know, it was like, Whoa, this is, there's something to this, you know? And then you kind of like, once you get that taste of blood in the water, then you go all in and you just go ham and, 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 you know, go full fledged into it. So I, that's, that's great. I love it. I'm curious about, um, your progression from the, um, the rentals to the flips and to the lending. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? And, and I, I see this very, very often, like it's a very common trajectory and path. Like you see a lot of people who start with the rentals because it's the lowest kind of barrier to entry. Like, okay, I'll just get like one or two doors. Then you get the, the taste of the cash flow, and you're like, okay, let's scale this up. Then you get tired of the rentals. You move to the flips. Then you do some, you know, some land development and, and, and land flipping or whatever. Then you move into the, the lending side. So give us, give us kind of like the, the high level overview of your transition through those different phases. Yeah, so I, I fell into the trap that a lot of new investors fall into, like, oh, I'm going to buy all these rental properties and I'm going to have all this passive income, passive <laughs> income, right? And I'm going to buy all the stuff and I'm going to live off the rental income. It's total BS, uh -huh. right? And so we got into that and realized that you can't live off that. And actually, you just, made, just basically need to sit on all your all your rental income for when that HVAC goes out or the roof goes out. And so my goal then became, how can I shorten my cash conversion cycle? Because with rentals, the cash conversion cycle is extremely long. And so we're like, well, let's do some flips. We had some properties that we were kind of looking at to be rentals. Like, let's just flip them and we can get cash so that we can, you know, a have some cash in the bank and all as well as pick up, like we had HVAC go out and we needed some additional liquidity. Um, and so we did, some flipping. And then we're like, okay, how else can we shorten the cash conversion cycle? So then we started a wholesale business because we also wanted to increase our amount of leads coming in for our rental, you know, portfolio. Um, and then all along the way, you know, as you start taking on more and more things, and, and a lot of people talk about this, right? You have so many things going that you're not giving enough time to any one thing, mm. and then everything starts suffering. And yep. so while we have the wholesaling and the flipping and the rentals, like some of the flips didn't produce as much cash as they wanted, as we wanted them to. And what I saw was where we maybe made $15,000 on a flip because, you know, the market shifted on us a little bit. We still made money, but our lender, who is funding it, he made like $18,000 yeah. 
And nope. he didn't do anything. He wasn't chasing contractors around. He wasn't trying to pick out LVP. He wasn't doing all these things. I'm like, all right. So that that is my, very appealing to me. And that how do I how do I do that right? And so uh, some sh- some legislation came about in North Carolina last year around wholesaling for double close funding. And mm. so basically, they were saying that assignment of, uh, contracts were considered a commission, and that you couldn't get a commission unless you were a realtor. And so I saw an opportunity. Let's pool a little bit of money from some investors and do some double close funding. It'll be quick, same day, you know, send 10,000 or send a hundred thousand in, get a hundred thousand one back. Right. And so we started doing that and a magical thing happens when you start telling people you have money, they start bringing you all these random opportunities. Right. Yep. (laughs) And so it happens. And so most of them, most of them are total dog crap. But every now and then there's a diamond. And one of the guys I knew pretty well, he's like, Hey, I've got a guy. He's going to, he had some, uh, legal issues come up, but he's got some um, land sitting there that's got a bunch of equity on it. He needs about 200K to basically get through this other project. And he is willing to pay you a pretty significant rate for this for just like four weeks, right? It was going to be a total of about $10,000 profit um, for us. And so, uh, sure, let's, let's do that. It was a no brainer. Well, that project took him way longer than what it should have. And what turned was going to be a pretty good deal turned into like a home run as we got all those funds back and ended up netting about a 70K profit over a eight month loan. Wow. Uh, yeah. And so while that one was going, we're like, we see a need here because we have multiple people in my network that are developers or flippers. And these guys are people that have equity in performing assets, right? They've got rental properties, or maybe they have land that's in first position, but they've got three or four projects going all at one time. And they get cash strapped because all their cash gets tied up in one project to draw, gets delayed because of permits or contractors take too long or something happens. And all of a sudden you got two or three other projects that are sitting there, not able to have any work done to them because you have a liquidity issue. And so instead of making them go and do a refinance on performing assets they have and destroying their cash flow there for a long period of time, or having them sit there and just eat those finance charges, we'll come in and do blanket loans on their performing assets. So let's say we'll pick up two or three rental properties, put a first or a second position on them, and then provide them the liquidity for a short period of time to keep those projects moving. Mm. And then what's nice about our product is then when they're done with that, They can choose to have us satisfy that collateral that we've pulled together, or we can just sit on it at no cost. And the next time they need the liquidity, it's a quick two to three day turnaround time because we already have the collateral established. Ah. And so it's become very, very helpful for a lot of these large established flippers to have these performing assets or even several developers that just need this ability to pull cash out quickly, get projects moving again, um, and then get back in the game. Interesting. I, that's that's very interesting. So you you essentially leave the liens in place, and they can use you as a line of credit. You know when they want. It, it's a technically not a full line of credit because they're they're new loans every time we have origination points and stuff. Oh, okay. But, okay. You know, it. I haven't found a perfect name for what it is, but it you know it's essentially you know a, a collateral that we're just holding there for as long as they want us to, right? We, we re-up it every year or we'll pull it. You know, there's certain legislations in place. We can't just leave a second in place indefinitely. Totally. Yeah. Um, but like we've got one flipper that's used it like five times. You know, he pulls 40, 50K, uses it for two months, sends it back, pulls 40, 50K. And then the other place we're finding good use of it is, you know, a lot of people that have new construction loans going, you know, maybe they don't want to use up all their cash in hand uh, to fund all the framing materials or whatever. So they'll, you know, use the collateral that they have, get 75K, buy buy all their materials and then use their draw to pay us back. So. Mm, Amazing. Okay. So there's, there's, there's two main things that I want to unpack here. There's a lot of good points, a lot of ways we could take this, but uh, the, the first is, is when you talked about how you made 15 grand and then your lender made 18 grand. And we we had a very similar experience. Um, we were flipping a property. It was right around COVID. Just about everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong. You know, like some projects are just just like that. Um, and I remember, uh, so it 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 was we were having problems sourcing different materials. So like we we had this house that was almost completely done. The only thing that we couldn't get was baseboard. 
And I mm. remember at the time I was calling every warehouse, every supplier, every distribution company that I could think of. And I'm like, look, I'll, I'll drive 12 hours to you with a trailer to get, you know, to like get baseboard so we can finish this project. It was just, it was a nightmare. Um, and, and in the end, after everything was all said and done, we sold the project. I think we, we basically broke even, but I think we made like 1200 bucks. And I remember looking at the HUD statement and our lender had made $25,000. And I was like, oh, you gotta be kidding me. Like this, this dude, like he didn't lose an ounce of sleep. Like you said, he's not picking out flooring and driving across the country to source materials. It was just a nightmare. So that was for us when, again, that light bulb moment went on. We're like, okay, we gotta, we gotta transition more into this. So, um, I, I resonate with that that very closely. Yeah. And then yeah, we, um, we always tracked how much we, we burnt per day in interest charges. And so it's interesting being on this side versus that side, because that side, every time a closing was delayed by a day or two, it's like, Oh, that's $75 in the backwards. <laughs> that's $75 on this side. It's like, Oh, there's 75 more. There's 75 yep, yep. more. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the inverse. Yeah. yeah. Which, which is funny. Cause that leads into the, the next thing I was thinking about. Um, you know, that, that really quick four week, like bridge loan or supposedly four week bridge loan. Um, I can't tell you how many borrowers we've had who have said, it'll be a really quick project. It'll be a super quick project. Like, and, and I was, it's funny because in the beginning I was so naive to that. I was like, um, you know, like, like I was thinking about this particular individual. Um, and I, we actually did another uh, episode on the podcast talking all about it, if you're interested, but, um, we, this individual came to us and said, look, I'm kind of, I'm kind of strapped on cash. I don't have a lot of funds. Um, this will be a super quick project. Would you like, would you do two points instead of three points? And it was like supposed to be a two week deal. I was really tempted to like do just the two points, help the guy out. But in the end I was like, no, sorry. Like the, the points are how, that's how we fund our business. That's how we run. That's how we operate. And so we didn't negotiate on points. Um, we, we still have that loan on the books and it's been going on for a about seven months and it was supposed to be a three week project. So it's just, it's very interesting to me that you've had the same experience. And I think a lot of lenders probably have, but, um, projects don't always go according to plan. And that's, what's so great about being on this side of the business. This, this business model is when things don't go according to plan, you, you make more money. And that's, that's not to say that you don't want your projects to go according to plan, right? Like you, you want to have a good relationship with your borrowers and make sure that they're successful. You, so you can also be successful, but, um, just intrinsically, it's a, it's a better business model because you make money the whole time, regardless of how the, how the project goes. So it's it, anyway, interesting. Yeah, I, I 100% agree with that. I think that you and I both have a unique perspective that a lot of people in the the lending space don't, you know, that are doing similar, that we've been in those trenches, right? We know how projects can go sideways. And so like someone comes to me and said, oh, this project, you know, we're, we're finishing up paint. We're going to be on the market in three weeks. And I just kind of chuckle at him. Okay, yeah, okay good so luck. <laughs> you're, you're going to be on the market in six to eight weeks. And then it's going to take four weeks to find a buyer and four weeks to four to six weeks to sell it. Exactly. Um, so like we, we instinctively have a different level of knowledge that not only helps us talk to our borrowers, like, that, do you really want to make this decision to, to borrow this money? Because we want to get paid back. We want you to be successful, um, but we really want our money back. And we also have the ability to look at a piece of property and be like, okay, the appraisal came back at 237. There's no way if I have to sell this today in its current state, I'm selling it for 237. Like it's, you know, December, if I'm going to try to turn it quick, like I'm going to put it on the market for 199 and that's the price I'm going to use to run my comps on because at the end of the day, I've got to make sure my money and more importantly, my investor's money is fully protected. And absolutely. so using just whatever an appraisal appraiser says that has absolutely no skin in the game is never a good, good eye idea. You got to look at all the pieces of data you have, and then you have to use experience to understand what this market is going to do and what you actually could get if you put it on the market, put the property on the market and use that to, to figure out what your LTV is and what you can loan at. I love it. I love it. There's, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of times that borrowers will come to us and they'll, they'll, you know, obviously they're going to give us optimistic numbers. They, they want the, the highest LTV they can get and things like that. But when I was flipping houses, I, there were a number of times and we had probably two or three lenders that we used like pretty regularly. Um, I think I had a situation with each individual lender where they said, Bryce, do not do this project. 
They said, I mean, I, I would not do this project. You're, you're welcome to do this project, but I won't be the person funding it. And that, that saved me. Like we, we had a lot of really good deals that, that did go well. We made a lot of money and we did just fine. But having that second set of eyes was so invaluable to us because it was just, it was just another, you know, guess and check, right? Like it was another, another checks and balances to make sure that everything was, was good. And so as a lender, you see a lot of deals come across your desk. You look at a lot of projects, you look at a lot of numbers and because of that repetition and tie that with the background that you had as a flipper already, like, you know, your market, you know, your numbers, you know, like, like you said, like, okay, you're not going to list this on day one and have it sell the next day. Like it's going to take four weeks to find a borrower. And then it's going to take 30 to 45 days, assuming no issues to close. Like it's, it's, it's having that experience and having that background is so huge. And I see a lot of people who are like, oh, I want to get into the lending space. I, if you don't have a background in real estate, that's probably not a great way to start. Or maybe you disagree with that, but I, I would assume you're, you're on the same page. I think anybody can do anything if they work really hard and, That's and le learn it, right? I think that the learning curve to get into real estate lending without having a real estate background is extraordinarily steep because there's a lot of nuances that come into play that you just aren't aware of um, when lending or when borrowing even um, if you haven't been there and done that and seen a bunch of closings. Absolutely. I remember um, there was a there was a borrower that came to us. She was looking to flip her first house, and and since then we've kind of tra you know changed our model. We actually don't um, we don't give funds to first time flippers. We want to see like at least three to five HUD statements. But again, that was kind of in the beginning when we were a little bit more ignorant. But um, by at this time we had still flipped about eighty homes. You know, so I remember going out, meeting this girl, um, walking the project, and and I remember thinking, man, this girl is so clueless. Cause I remember she was, we were walking around the property. She was just like casually saying, Oh, the roof is fine. I'm like in my head, no, the roof is not fine. Like you could see all the missing shingles. Like this is going to have to be replaced. That's at least a $12,000 expense. And then she said, okay, there was this, uh, there's this like lean to covered carport. And she's like, I'm going to extend this out and I'm going to make it into a two car garage. I'm like, what, why, why on earth would you ever do that? And then also I said, um, no, you can't because if you do a two-car garage, that door is going to be at least 16 feet. So your building is going to be at least 20 feet and you're going to run into your setbacks on the side of the property and the city's not going to allow you to do it. You know, it's just like all these things that for you and I, that just is common sense. Like, no, you don't do that. But if you don't, if you don't know what you don't know, then, you know, how are you supposed to do it? So, um, anyway, I could, I could hit on that all day, but it's, it's, it would be very difficult to get into this business unless you have that experience and unless you've done it yourself a couple of times. Yeah. It, it's so true that they, there's just like all these tells that you just, you can tell that they're not experienced. Right. Um, but picking out the ones that are experienced based on who's being conservative in their numbers, who's bringing you good deals, who's not wasting your time is, is the key to being successful at this side of things. It's also the key to being successful on the other side of things. And you, you really want, like my goal is to find a good set of key borrowers that are going to use my services over and over again, and they're being successful. And then my investors are being successful and I'm in the middle being successful you know, helping that along the way. I think you made an interesting comment, like, oh, we don't invest in new time, new and new, uh, new investors. Right. I think that's a general consensus across fixed and flippers, but it leaves everybody in kind of this interesting spot where I can't get experience because I don't have experience. Right. 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 And I, I've just, I thought about this a little bit in the past and it's not my business model, but I feel like there's something out there where there could be some sort of mentorship program that a fix and flip company or lender puts together where you've got, you know, borrowers that have experience and you've got new borrowers that don't have experience but have deals, you could pair them up with your money and create some mm -hmm. sort of program to nurture and create lifelong or long-term customers that had now have the experience that have been trained Absolutely. up in the ways that you've been, you like to work in. Yeah. We've, yeah. we've done stuff in the past. Like if, if, you know, you, you, you mentioned something that like when you're talking to somebody on the phone, you can just tell, you know, the, the way that like the, the terms and the vernacular that you use, you can tell if they're experienced or not. Um, and what we've done in the past is if, if we can tell someone is less experienced, but you can, you can also tell that like they're a go-getter, you know, that they'll be able to like, at least kind of handle the project. Um, if they're newer, what we've done in the past is we've just like JV'd with them on the deal. Like we'll be the money mm -hmm. partner. You, you do the project, but 
you know, I'm, I'm going to hold your hand, but obviously that, that takes, you know, more, more time out of, out of your calendar. And so we're going to split the profits 50, 50, or maybe 60, 40, or even 70, 30, just because I'm going to be doing a lot of the the heavy lifting and I have way more to lose than you do. But if it's a home run deal, you know, it sometimes it's, it's kind of hard to, to pass those up. So we we've done that in the past, but, um, you know, we, we, we mentioned, uh, being a little bit more passive, you know, like talking about your, your FBA business, like you were doing all the fulfillment, you were doing all the inventory management. It wasn't, it wasn't passive. And so you moved into this business, like there's still obviously an aspect of work to it, but it, it is, it is passive in the sense that like, as long as everything's going smoothly, you've got a good borrower, you've got some, some work on the front end and some work on the, the back end. But during like the middle of the project, you kind of just sit back and, and collect interest, which is you know, why I think it's, it's such a great business model. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like pushing a cart up a hill, right? It takes a bit of effort to push it up the hill, but once you get it there, then it's just going to coast down. On and that's a lot down, yep. like, that, that's a lot like what a loan is. You know, you're, you're pushing, you're doing all the original, well, first you got to find the borrowers, you got to find the money. Then you put doing all the underwriting work, which I mean, if you're any good, you're doing pretty extensive underwriting. And yep. then once the loan's out there, then it's relatively easy. Just kind of give it a little kick every now and then making sure people are paying. And it, and if you're not learning all along the way, then you're really missing out. I mean, we are constantly adjusting and changing how we're doing things based on new knowledge that we have, you know, right. and, you know, when we first started, we were only doing, we just, we were letting all of our loans accrue until the end. Now we're taking monthly interest payments. We were doing, they were had to manually pay. Now we require auto ACH you yep. know, authorization yep. forms. You know, it's just like, how can we continue to improve and build the process to make it more scalable, more user friendly, and less risky. Yeah, and and that right there tells me that you're a good operator. Like the fact that you're constantly like iterating and innovating and changing and tweaking and adjusting. Like that's how business should be run, in my opinion. I, I we had it's funny. I swear, every time we you know when we were back in our rental days, every time we had like a weird, crazy like one off situation, our our contract would get a little bit longer and then a little bit longer and a little bit longer because we'd add different clauses like. Whoa, I never even thought about this, this situation, you know, and like, it's it, the fact that you are changing and adjusting. Um, that's, that's great. So, um, you, you mentioned a couple of things. I want to kind of pivot now and talk about your specific, um, business dive into like your, your lending model, how you run things, structure things. Cause I think that, um, probably, probably caters or, or applies to, to this audience the most, but, um, you mentioned something that previously in the past, you would let all your interest accrue until the very end. Um, now you, you collect monthly payments. The, the reason I want to touch on this is because we actually don't collect monthly payments and we really like that model. We, we accrue all the interest at the very end. And so I'm, I'm curious, um, to hear your, your pros and, and cons between, between each, each model. So obvious. So, th so the biggest pro is for the borrower to, to not collect, right? Because right. then they don't have to worry about it. But I would say that probably some of the biggest negative is for the borrower as well, and that it's building up and they're not thinking about it. And then they go to sell it and they've got this huge bill that they never, never thought of. We made the shift to monthly payments primarily for, for two main reasons. One, if you are basing your LTV off of the as is value and you're letting your interest accrue, you are degrading your protective equity in the property mm. that you have securing your investment. That is the number one reason why we are doing it. So you and I talked about how a loan maybe go is told to us it's going to be, oh, it's going to be a quick one, three, four weeks, and then it stretches to seven, eight months. Like the amount of equity that was protecting our asset at the beginning versus the end, if you accrue it, is you know significantly less. And we want to maintain the largest amount of protective equity we can. Absolutely. Number two reason is honestly, if we require them to pay every month and they stop paying on month three, it gives us a huge red flag that something's not right. We can reach out and proactively talk to them, figure out what's going on and put a plan in place before we ever get close to that default window or start the default process before we've accrued months and months and months of interest that we now owe to our investors or, or technically owe to the fund, right? So we can get ahead of it and limit some of our, our impacts to that, you know, basically that runaway train that could happen. Because if you let things accrue for eight months and all of a sudden then they default, now you're out not only your principal, 
but almost eight, nine months worth of interest. However, when they stopped paying, that could have been you know, brought back into the fund and then leveraged towards another project and been making you money. So it, it, it is a risk reduction strategy for us, for our fund, for our investors, and for the borrowers. Hmm. I, I, I love it. You know, this, what's so great about this business and this industry is that it's so unique in the sense that like everybody does their business just a, just a little bit, bit differently. And I, um, I, I see the, the pros and cons to both side and, and just, um, uh, it, it's just different. I, I'm not saying like one's better than the other. Like we, we, obviously we have our reasons for, for doing it the, the, you know, the opposite way, but, um, mm -hmm. just to, uh, like, we, we have found, so I, I'm trying to think about when I was flipping, um, and we like, say we had 10 projects going on simultaneously. Um, the reason that people come to you in the first place is because they're, they're low on, on capital or, or liquidity. Right. So if you've got four five, six, seven projects going at the same time, you could be paying $40,000 a month in monthly payments, you know, depending on the, the loan amounts and things like that. So when I was flipping personally, I really, I really enjoyed not having to make monthly payments. And we found a lot of our borrowers who have liked that too. Um, just because it, you know, it, it's easier on the the cash flow side. So uh, again, no, I'm not, not saying you're right is right or wrong, but it's just, it's interesting to see like all the different ways that people structure but, it. Yeah, but there's other ways around that too, because if the property has enough equity in it, right, then increase your loan size and escrow the term of the loans monthly payments. Absolutely. Then they don't have to make any monthly payments and you're still protecting your equity. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, there's a million ways around it. I, I love it. It's great. It's that's, that's amazing. Wow. Okay. Um, let's, uh, talk, talk a little bit about your, um, you, you mentioned a fund. So I assume you have like a fund structure. You're not doing like the, the direct placement or like trustee mm -hmm. investing. Um, talk, talk about like your decision to go that way, what that process was just, you know, high, high level overview for everyone. Yeah. So we started a 506 C fund. Um, so I'm allowed to talk about it. Right. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> so in fund structure and probably most of your audience knows this, right. We were looking at basically 506 B or 506 C 506 B is close family, you know, people, you know, in your direct circle, um, but you're not allowed to advertise and you have to know them directly. Uh, and then 506 C is you have to, they have to be accredited and you have to basically, um, get proof of accreditation, but you're allowed to freely advertise. Um, we chose the 506C side of things because we wanted to basically be able to do things like this, uh, so advertise on you know Google, wherever. And, and so that's where a lot of our capital is coming from is you know just doing Google ads, Facebook ads, you know, reaching out to people and not having to build a, con a network you know, that's one person removed from yourself. Um, we started that. And basically the reason we started a fund was the way these loans are, our loans are maximum six months. And so prior to getting the fund started, we were doing kind of a direct placement model, almost like a syndication where we would get a loan and then I would reach out to my network. We would raise the capital for it. We'd put the documents all together and then fund the loan. But when you're doing, you know, four to five of those loans a month and those mature every two to six months, it becomes a lot of transactions required by our investors. And, and additionally, if I have my money, I'm an investor and I have my money in one deal, all of my hopes and dreams are on that one deal, right? With a fund, you know, your money goes into the larger pot. And from the time you, the day your money hits our fund, you are now fully diverse diversified across all of the portfolio that we have. And so it's, it's less risky and we're allowed to give percent or um, profit sharing. So our fund is a 15% pref with a 60% profit share. And so we're able to give much better returns because our investors are trusting us with money for a longer period of time. It's allowing them to not have to do transactions, you know, all the time and do their own due diligence on each one of those deals. But it does require them to know us, trust that we're making the right decisions and believe in our underwriting process that we have their best interest at heart. So there is a, a bit of a push pull. And I've had investors that have invested with me for years that aren't big fans of the trust structure, or sorry, the fund structure, because they want to be able to underwrite every single loan that comes in. And as we look at our fund model as a way to scale our business, 
beyond where it is today and beyond where, where I think it will be next year, the ability or the desire to share individual documents on every single deal with every single investor that we work with, you know, isn't very appetizing to me, not because we have anything to hide. It's just a speed of moving forward, right? Absolutely. We want to have excellent customer service for our borrowers, which means collecting all the information that we possibly can get from them to make sure their loan is as risk riskless or secure as absolutely possible, and then be able to fund that as soon as the title work is done and we're ready to move forward and not have to wait for someone's self-directed IRA custodian to send the funds over um, or whatever the holdup might be. We want to make sure things are moving. And we also want to make sure that we have clear visibility in exactly what our dollars are doing, where they're doing it, so we can communicate back to our investors on a regular basis what's going on. And so they have peace of mind on what we're doing is the right thing and that their money is growing the way they expect it to. I love it. I love it. We That's man, that's, that's huge. So we, we also have a fund and we really like that model, um, uh, because previously we were doing the, you know, the trustee method as well. I think that's how most people start out. Um, or I, I haven't heard of a single person who hasn't started out doing that, that method. Um, and, and we, you know, for so many reasons that, that you just mentioned too, we, we didn't love that model there. Again, there's some pros and cons, like um, you, you get to, uh, interface with your, your investors more. So like probably investor relations are a little bit easier, but on the, the flip side, we had a lot of headache with like investors, not sending their wires fast enough. So we, we had this loan that they had committed to, and like, we were at the closing table and like the funds weren't there. And so like, there were some projects that we, we said we could fund fully. And, and at the end of the day, we couldn't like at the very last minute, it didn't come through and it fell apart. And for the borrower, that's a nightmare because they're, they're pissed at you. And, you know, it's just this whole mess and it's just, it's not great. And unfortunately, even though it's not your fault, it's still your business and your company's reputation on the line. And do you think those people are going to come to you and, and borrow from you ever again? Like, of course not. You know, they had a horrible yeah. experience. So obviously like that can be combated by setting up investor uh, expectations, uh, collecting the wire, maybe a week before you need it. You know, there's all, all ways to go about that, but um, similar to you, I like looking at the bank account and saying, yes, we can, or no, we cannot fund this loan. It's just, it just blanket. I, I now tell borrowers, if I say that I can, I can, if I say that I can't, I cannot. And it's just cut and dry. It's black and white. I can, or I can't. And that's it. And it's worked out really, really well for us. Um, another thing that I did want to briefly touch on and, and, and you may disagree with me, but when we were setting up our fund, we, we spoke to probably four or five, six different attorneys. I wanted to kind of get like a gambit of, of expertise and just different opinions on it. Um, and what I learned was the trust deed model is actually illegal in some, some ways in the sense that when you're taking, um, when you're taking a, a note and you're essentially carving it up and you're putting four or five, six different investors on this note, um, that actually falls under securities laws because what you're offering is now a security. Um, and I, I don't say that to scare people, but just, I know there are a lot of people out there who are a little bit, um, afraid of the fund in the sense that like, there is some managerial overhead. Sometimes it can be expensive. You know, there, there is some, some other stuff you need to be aware of. Um, but also be aware that the trust deed model can be considered illegal. Again, do I think something's going to happen? Do I think you're going to get caught? Do I think you're going to get sued? I don't because I know a lot of people who do it that way. Um, but just, you know, something, something to, to throw out there and, and mention. So, um, yeah, I've heard, I've heard similar things about have you? that. Okay. I mean, yeah. And so it's, it's, we've done them obviously, you know, Same. once in a while, and we'll, I have to. We'll, yeah. we'll still do them. Right. And, you know, the fund gets, you know, fully allocated or whatever, and we've got a good loan coming in. Um, but we're actively trying to move away from them. Um, just because we want, I mean, everything about business is what is the next issue that's going to be coming up and how do I mitigate that before it actually causes financial stress to the business? Right. Yep. And yep. so as that is a potential risk in the future, we're actively trying to navigate direction away from things that like that, that could possibly cause an issue because there'll be enough other things that we have don't have any sight on that all of a sudden pop up. If we can even eliminate a few of the things we know might be issues in the future, you know, it, it puts you in an overall a lot better position. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Okay. Can you go over like your, um, what your experience was, with like setting up a fund, uh, rough numbers, um, how, you know, how long it took, like what, what was your overall experience with it? Yeah. So, so overall experience was all right. Um, I, I have a small, um, fund manager mastermind that I run once a month. So there's like three or four of us. We're all in the same kind of place in the fund. And a lot of them already had had funds. And so I spent a lot of time talking to them um, and they already had an attorney that they'd used before. And so we, I already had a pretty good idea what structure I wanted. I spent a ton of time modeling out. Um, I say, I, I have a CFO that's incredible with the models and stuff. So him and I had spent a ton of time modeling out what the fund should look like. And then we went back and forth. It probably took me about two months, two and a half months of okay. back and forth, mostly forth to the attorney and then him working on stuff and then me redlining things um, to get it to the place where I was happy with it. And that includes a subscription agreement, the OA, the PPM, the PPM took, I, I wouldn't say the PPM took the longest. We got the subscription agreement and the OA done first. And then using those uh, chat GPT and another PPM that someone else had, had provided to me, I put another PPM together and gave it to him to review. Nice. Uh, and then he worked on it. So that saved me a ton of time and a ton of money um, because he has had to update it as opposed to starting from a blank sheet of paper. Um, so all in, we were probably two and a half months from the time we started, maybe three from the time we started to when we actually signed documents. Um, and then all told, I think, I think it was just under 20 grand, like 15 to 15, 18 grand uh, for all those documents. Wow. Um, and we have, we had to do one uh, edit to our OA since then. Um, but other than that, things have been fairly static. Wow. Okay. And in, in the, in the realm, as far as like the, the legal space goes, that's actually fairly inexpensive. You know, I've heard of a lot of people that to get their PPM docs and everything like that, like I've, I've seen 35, $40,000, some, some as high as like 60 even, you know? So like, that's, I'd say that's, that's, you did a good job. That's great. So, so attorneys are very, very expensive teachers. And so if you can <laughs> find even 60 or 70% of the information and put something for them to react to and create edits and redline up, it saves just tons and tons because they're all billable by hours. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if you can get something that you can work off of and then give it to them to update and basically know exactly what you want, like these are the things that I want in it. This is the structure I want. This is the waterfall I want. This is how I want to distribute things out. These are clauses I want in to protect myself. These are clauses I want in to protect my investor and just spend a ton of time researching all that. The time you spend researching it and putting together a, an initial document, even though it's not you know, going to be a great legal document because, you know, you're not a lawyer, but to give to them to then work on, um, is going to save you a ton, a ton of money. Mm, that's a, that's a great, a great tip because so, so many people are like, I, I don't know anything about this. I don't want to understand anything about this. Like that's your job. I'm going to pay you to do that. Um, but if you're, if you're running a fund, you probably should have some basic understanding of what you're doing. Like, obviously, right. You know, like you should know the difference between a 506 B and a 506 C you should know, like what a sophisticated investor is versus accredited, like what it means to market and, and advertise and solicit funds and everything associated with it. If that. you're running an American or European waterfall, fall, fall style, you know I mean, if you have a fund and you're a fund manager, you should be able to quote, good portion of every portion of those documents. Absolutely. I've read every one of my documents a dozen times. Yep. I was actively involved, you know, up to my elbows in every sentence that was created in those things. And to just abjecate it and give it to an attorney and say, create me this document and Double then expect this. it to be what you want is asinine. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's huge. I, I love that. And and so many people are like, well, you know, I want to hire the professional. Absolutely you do like hire the professional, but, um, t time is money, but you, you can save yourself a lot of money. I'm a, I'm a big proponent of hiring things out and hiring the right person. So you don't have to deal with it, but like, you, you know, there's a threshold for that, right? Like if you can save yourself $20,000, is it worth in my mind to, to sit there for a day or two and learn the terms and the vernacular and common structures? Like, yeah, absolutely. Like 20 grand is 20 grand. That's, that's, that's not chump change by any stretch of the imagination. 
would you ask your flooring guy or your let's would you say you have your general contractor go renovate my house and then just walk away for six months, right? Not tell them what kind of floors you want or where do you want the rooms or like you right. can't How do, you do think that, that you project have, will turn out. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's not going to turn out good. It's going to be way more expensive because they're going to, they're not going to be conscious of the budget. They're not going to know what you want. You're going to have to make a bunch change of changes. Orders. Yep. And every time you have to do a change order, it's the same thing as a red line in an OA or a PPM, right? It's a change order. They're going to spend more billable hours fixing that and adjusting it. And so it, you have to be an active participant. And, you know, we, we made a ton of loans earlier in the year and then we were putting the fund together, you know, in like the spring and we made very few loans in April and May, June, uh, yeah, March, April, May, because I was dedicated almost all of my time to just getting those documents ready to go because yeah. that was the way of the future. And if it meant short-term delay in putting loans out and getting revenue for the long-term benefit of having it set up correctly, because we have an open-ended fund, it's not gonna go away in five years. It had to be done right the first time. Yep, yep, Go and, and go slow to, to move fast later, right? Like that's, that's 100%. huge. Um, 100%. Could you briefly, for, for those who are listening who aren't familiar with uh, the required documents, the, the PPM, the OA, the subscription agreements, you know, the investor questionnaire, all those things, can you just give like a high level overview of what each document does and why you need each, each you know, in each individual piece of piece of paper? Sure. So high level, a fund is basically two entities. There is a general partnership and a limited partnership. The general partnership is the group of people that are actively managing the money. They're, they're Bryce, they're the me, they're doing, they're finding the money, they're finding the borrowers, they're, they're doing all of that. And then there's the limited partnership, limited partnership operating agreement or, or LLP, uh, LLC, sorry, uh, is going to be what the investors actually invest in. So when you invest in a fund, you actually become a part of that LLC. And so as the limited partnership, your role is specifically there to provide capital and get returns, while the general partnership is there to manage that capital for the LP and make sure that those performas and those returns are met and that no laws are broken, um, that everybody is taken care of. And so when you are becoming a member of a fund as an LP or a limited partnership, there's gonna be a few documents you have to sign. Um, if for me, like me, I have a um, 506C, which means you're required to be accredited. So I require a set of documents that someone else might not if they're a 506B. I require some document that states that you are accredited. So the SEC doesn't come breathing down my neck and say, hey, are all you guys accredited? And so either a letter from your accountant or proof for the last two years of tax returns um, that you've made a certain amount of money or a, you know, basically a list of all of your assets and liabilities, excluding your primary residence. So that's number one. Number two is gonna be the, the operating agreement for the LLC that is the LP. And you're basically just going to sign that. And then there'll be a table at the bottom that says who you are, what your address is, how much you've committed, how much you've contributed and the dates. Um, and then the last document that you've, that we require is a subscription agreement. And this basically just says that, you know, you're going to be some supplying X amount of dollars. This is your name. This is your contact information. It gives some high level overview of what those dollars can be used for. The third document, which you don't have to sign, but is critical for a fund is the PPM or the private placement memorandum. And the shortest way to say what a PPM is, is a PPM is every way the fund could possibly lose money distilled down into a very succinct 80 some page document. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it also very clearly says how you as an investor are going to get paid, uh, how you can contribute money, uh, all the rules. It is the Bible for the fund. If you want to do anything for the fund, let's say I have my fund, it's dedicated for short-term real estate investing, and I want to go and invest it in oil and natural gas. I am pers I am not allowed to do that because our operating agreement, our PPM specifically states that we are for used as a debt fund for real estate. And so it limits what we as a general partnership can do with your money, but also calls out how we are to pay you back. And if there's any disputes or anything ever happens, key man, like if I get sick or die, what happens to the fund? You know, who takes over? Does it get shut down? How does it get distributed? You know, 
everything and anything. The whole point of that document is to try to line out every single thing that possibly could go wrong and either disclaim it or explain how it's going to be handled. I love it. Yeah. It's, uh, we, we joke with our, our investors, I, you know, when we're onboarding someone, I'll give them the PPM and I'll say, if, if you're having a, a hard time falling asleep tonight, like this is a snooze fest, you know, this is a, a good way to, to fall asleep, but it is like you are transparent in anything and everything, all the risks, like, like ours explicitly states, like this is an investment. There is an element of risk involved. You could lose money. Like you want to be very transparent. Do we think that's going to happen? No. Do we have a history of that happening? No, of course not. But like it, there, there is some risk. So I, you got to yeah. disclose it. You got to disclose everything, right? Yep. Just like when you sell a house, you got to disclose everything. And I don't want investors to come in and be blind, right? I want them to know what's going on and then trust that what we're doing is the right thing because we have shown really good returns. I have a history of returning 31% per annum to my investors over the last four Amazing. years, right? And so, but I want them to know what the risks are going in. And this is also why the SEC requires people to be accredited investors for these funds, because these aren't small chunks of money. Our minimum investment size is $75,000. Mm-hmm. And the SEC is trying to protect people that that's their last $75,000. And if they lose that, then they lose their house, right? And so they're protecting people by giving more hurdles for accredited investors to get over. But once you've gotten over it and you have those documents, it's not such a big deal. But the first time, you know, it can be a little bit tedious to either find all those asset documents, uh, especially if you don't have a very high income shown on a W-2, um, or you just have your CPA fill out a form um, yeah. that, that I, I usually provide like a template to my investors that get filled out. And then I have a document that um, says, hey, they said they're invested. The CPA said they're invested. Like, that, that should be enough proof. I don't know. Yeah. Else, yeah, that's enough for me to to mitigate my risk. Absolutely. So, and honestly, the risk of every other investor, because if we bring one investor in that's not accredited, it puts it puts a risk on everybody. And so we have yeah. to be very diligent about that. Absolutely. I love it. That's really good advice. Okay. All right. We're 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 getting close on time. So I want to kind of wind down um, and just briefly pick your brain just on like your, your basic uh, lending structure, like um, uh, basic numbers, like um, what, you know, your, your rates that you charge, your points, your, your LTVs that borrowers expect, just kind of give us like a brief overview of your, your lending model, just because like, like I already touched on, there's so many different ways to do this. You know, some people that we've talked to just have like a flat 22% interest that they do. They don't charge any points, you know? So give us, mm-hmm. give us a, an overview of how you run and operate your, your business. Yeah. So for our gap loans, which is specifically what I'll talk about here, it's our, our flagship product. Um, we're charging anywhere, anywhere between two and four points on origination side of things. Uh, we don't loan anything less than 40,000. Um, and our loans are all six month or less. Now we do allow for up to three extensions with a extension costing one point and going for three months. Um, but they're, the loans are primarily designed to be short term loans. And you'll see why when I talk about rates in a second, because our money isn't cheap. Um, we specifically have designed it to be expensive because a, some of our loans are second position, which are inherently more risky. Now we take Mm. a lot of that risk out by the significant amount of underwriting we do and the LTVs we, we loan at. Um, but we also have some first position as well. So our rates range anywhere between two and three points per month. So you can do the math. It's 24 to 36% interest. Um, and we require monthly interest only payments on that uh, with the ACH authorization form signed at closing to, and we also require them to provide bank statements showing that there's money in those accounts. Um, now, you know, we don't loan less than 40K because a lot of times we'll have people, oh, I want to borrow 20K for, you know, two months or a month. You know, that that isn't a big enough return to, to make Offset it worth the risk. time. Yeah. And, yeah, exactly. And, you know, the, the range and rate from two to three points really depends on the amount of um, equity that's protecting, but primarily if it's a first or second position lean uh, collateral. So, you know, a chunk of ground that is at 40 or 50 percent LTV, it's in second position is going to warrant a higher interest rate than a chunk of or a chunk of ground that or even a house that's at first position at 60 percent LTV because there's just there's 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 more risk associated with a second position. So we're constantly weighing all of that out to make sure that we're producing the best income for our business while also providing a service. Um, And honestly, we have such demand for our product that we 
and we once in a while talk about bringing our higher rate down a little bit, but we can't, we can't keep funds in the fund. We have so much demand for it um, that there just hasn't been a need to bring the rates down. Um, yeah. Because you think about like, I've got a loan going out next week. I borrow in $103,000. They're going to use it for about a month. Right. And so we're ch- yeah, about a month. We're charging three points and three points. So six points. So if they use it for a month, that's six thousand dollars, um, which isn't bad to get about one hundred K in liquidity, you know, within two weeks. That's right? amazing. And, and they're backing it with, you know, a chunk of ground that's worth one point four million. That's got one hundred and seventy five thousand dollar loan on it. So our LTV is very strong there. That's a killer deal. Um, yeah, it's a killer deal. And we. You know, we don't lend over 65% LTV and that's first plus second position. Oh, wow. You know, historically, you know, the last 150 years, the biggest downturns in the economy have caused a 30% reduction in home prices at the worst. And so at 60%, that gives us a 30% plus another 10% buffer to ensure that we can get not only our capital back, but any remaining um, interest that may be owed. Very insulated. That's amazing. Wow. Do you have um, any issues with like uh, usury laws or anything like that in, in North Carolina because you are charging such high interest rates? So not in North Carolina. We specifically target some states that don't. So um, North Carolina, South Carolina, those are our primary two states right now. Uh, we also get into Georgia a little bit. Those have no usury laws on commercial loans. Ah. So usury laws tend to apply to residential loans. Now, Florida. It has a usury law of 18% uh, on an annual basis for commercial loans as well. And so for that reason, we haven't extended any loan products into Florida. Mm. Uh, Texas doesn't have an issue, but Texas has got so much oil money that we haven't been able to find a good niche there because the, a lot of people can just find people who will give them money for cheaper. Mm. Um, so we just, we don't fit there. But honestly, I mean, I got $6.3 million worth of loan requests in the last 45 days. Uh, uh, just in North Carolina and South Carolina. So um, until we expand further and, and and really scale up our business, we haven't had a need to uh, really mess with our rates. That's amazing. And how? I mean, that's that's great loan volume. How do you how do you pick and choose which loans you you do fund or don't? Is it just based off like collateral and and equity, or like how do you how do you pick and choose? So it, it's like a trifecta, right? How much equity is in the property? How what the history? or quality of the borrower is, right? And where the property is. So, um, you know, if somebody brings me something in Maryland and they have the other two legs of the stool, great. We're still not going to loan there because I don't know that market that well, Yeah, you know, currently. So it's got to be somebody that has a ton of equity. I know the area and the borrower either has really good references, has a ton of capacity in their bank account, um, which we see that too. We have we see people that have you know two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, million dollars in the bank account, and still want to borrow money from us um, yeah. because they just don't want to give up their their liquidity in their bank account. Um, you know, and or the property has just a ton of equity there. Um, there's another one that I'm looking at next, uh, probably going to fund next week. Now they that's got I think that one's going to be an eighteen percent LTV loan. So, wow. And we're going to wow. fund, and that's and that's with us bringing five hundred thousand dollar loan forward. Holy wow, <laughs> that's crazy! Holy cow, my goodness! So, so those the good deals are out there. You just have to be really selective, and you know, right now we're funding about two to three deals a month, mm-hmm. uh, and not because we don't have a ton of other demand. It's because I'm very selective about what loans we're we're putting out because it's my investors' money, and this is my first fund. And we're going to make it really, really successful in the next five years. And we're going to do a full audit. And then I'm going to have a very strong stool to stand on as I continue to grow and raise additional funds in other projects in the future. I love it. Holy cow. Lauren, my goodness. I have about a thousand other questions <laughs> that I'd love to ask you, but I'll, uh, I'll definitely be, be conscious of your time. Cause I know we're coming up just on just under an hour, but, uh, if, uh, for, first off, thank you. My, my goodness, this is, this is amazing. I really do. I'd, I'd love to have you come back a, another time because there's so many other different topics we could, we could dive into. Anytime. Um, but, uh, if, if anybody wants to reach out to you either just for like knowledge or, or content, pick your brain, or even just to borrow from you, what's, what's the best way to, to, to find you? 
uh, two ways. So I'm fairly active on Instagram. So it's invest with Lauren, L O R E N. Uh, or you can go to our website. It's R E I high yield.com. And uh, you'll see all of our investor products there. And then you can basically book a call with our team uh, and we'll talk to you, especially if you're interested in investing in the fund. Uh, if you're that. interested in uh, borrowing, uh, reach out to me on Instagram and uh, our website is reidoubleclose.com currently for that. Perfect. Okay. And we'll definitely put all the, your, your contact info and everything down in the, in the show notes. So if anybody wants to get a hold of Lauren, you can, you can find his, his info there as well. But again, Lauren, thank you so much for coming. I, I appreciate your time and the the wisdom and knowledge you've been able to, to impart with us and uh, until next time. Yeah. Thanks for having me.